In this episode, we are going to cover RevOps, marketing analytics, and Google Analytics 4. I spoke with Joe LaGruda about this and so much more because there's so much happening in the world of marketing operations and analytics right now. Joe is a marketing ops expert who dives deep into RevOps for companies, and he's particularly qualified to help us all navigate this shift with GA4 that's coming very soon. So let's dive right into the episode. Let's start right there with the relationship between like RevOps and then market analytics as we know it. Like, what are some key differences? What's the relationship between those two things? Yeah. So it's funny because this is a hot topic on LinkedIn, on Slack, all the communities that we're part of. A lot of people call RevOps RevOps and think that it's RevOps, but a lot of times it's just sales ops. RevOps is really all encompassing, in my opinion, it includes sales ops and marketing ops. When we say sales ops, marketing ops, I usually think Marketing ops is really there to support the marketing team, solving marketing problems with technology and data. Sales ops helps the sales teams focus on enablement, focus on CRM, Salesforce, a lot of those items as well. And then we like to say RevOps is all encompassing, encompasses both of those things. The hot debate right now is that a lot of people call it RevOps when it's really sales ops. But in my opinion, RevOps is really that holistic, looking at the business as a whole, driving revenue and go to market strategy. So for you then... What do you focus most of your time on? Is it more on, if you're combining those two things into one, is it more on the sales side, more on the marketing side, or do you really just only look holistically? Yeah, me personally, I look holistically. I grew up in the marketing ops side of things, but actually had a sales background as well. Helped out on the sales operation side of things. So I've holistically looked at, I like to call it go-to-market operations, really, because I like to look at the inner interplay and interrelationship between marketing and sales. When I look at things, I look at, when I look at technology, I look at the CRM and the marketing automation platforms and the integration between those two. And then all those tech stacks combined. I like to flow personally between marketing ops and sales ops. And uh, that's why I say the holistic view of rev ops is really where I sit. Uh, but we have a lot of really good disciplined folks that sit in the sales ops side or marketing ops side specifically. The best ones that we see are usually those that have evolved out of that discipline. So people that were on the sales ops side that have come from like a BDR or sales background usually make really good operations folks. Same thing on the marketing side. We see a lot of really good marketing ops folks that come out of the demand gen side of things and just have like a knack for technology and data and just pursue that there. If we took a step back, like what is a typical kind of relationship look like with the companies that you work with? What are the core projects you people bring you on to execute on? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say it depends. A lot of times where we start is really like funnel and everyone is always looking for the elusive, like repeatable and scalable funnel. I mean, we usually are brought on to help build the technology to solve that. Where we like to function is typically start with a general audit of the systems and reports and data. And I would have a framework that we use that would just outline uh, all the different systems in play and then all the different strategy components. For me, operations really enables business strategy. So if you're only looking at technology, you're not looking at business strategy, you're missing a piece of the pie. Looking at the technology, but then also looking at the strategy. That's like the general audit that we come in and work with. Uh, but a lot of times, like Salesforce is usually a big one, HubSpot, Marketo, um, kind of just general audit and making sure that the funnel is set up to support all the different marketing initiatives. The big one lately has been attribution. There's no right way to do attribution, in my opinion. So there's a lot of reporting and analytics and tracking that comes into that. So coming in to set that up, making sure that your reporting set up to, you're actually having a good view of your funnel and then looking at the bottlenecks in your funnel to, to update and make sure that. Another big piece in the marketing ops side is like really campaign execution. A lot goes into the campaign and not only just the execution of getting life cycle nurtures, emails and all that out, but setting up your ads and making sure retargeting is on the right audiences and things like that. It's primarily where, you know, Audit technology, make sure our systems are all connected, running, make sure your funnel, you got good visibility, good attribution, and then really they're diving into the strategy and seeing what could be improved, what systems need to be improved, what processes can be optimized, et cetera. Let's talk about that audit for a second. At its base level for the audit, what are some of the questions that you're asking that kind of give you an indication of where to go next? Yeah. So on the marketing side, it's like, what channels are you using? It's like the high level that we start with. If you're using your paid ads platforms and it's like, is that funneling back in? Do you have correct tracking set up? Um, is it integrated with Google Analytics? Is it integrated with your marketing automation platform? Do you have that information flowing so that you can actually see and attribute your conversion actions all the way back to the ads and the campaign and the creative? So you can start to get granular level of what's working and what's not. So really starting at the channel level there, that starts to fall into like all the different integrations in your tech stack there. 
On the sales side, we start to look at if reporting is set up, which should be for uh, like funnels. And then we'll start to dig into the funnel stages there. Are you getting leads converting to your contacts, to your opportunities, are opportunities closing one? What do those rates look like? And what do those bottlenecks look like? Typically, a, we always see a handoff bottleneck. So like when marketing passes those leads to sales, and there's usually a breakdown and we usually see a low conversion rate at that point. So it's like addressing what that looks like. What are good opportunities there? Is it better lead scoring? Is it better handoff process notifications? Starting to look at that full funnel that way. We have like some technical things that we'll look at too, and just to making sure like lead to conversion mapping is set up, making sure the campaigns are functioning, making sure your domain and deliverability is set up correctly. But really again, pulling it all the way out, looking at that marketing strategy, the channels and all the way down to the sales handoffs and execution. Yeah. I'm sure you've done your fair share of those at this point and probably some common themes or mistakes, I guess, that come up pretty often with these. I'm curious to know what those like most common uh-ohs are that you see in people's systems that just like keep coming up all the time. Yeah, for sure. It's on the marketing side, it's all about tracking. I, there's a lot of siloed systems and a lot of broken tracking. And I think when you start to get into reporting and start to dig deeper into it, you start to see broken journeys. And then it's really hard to allocate like your marketing spend back to what was closed $1, right? Like all the beginning down to when that became a customer. And really having that tracked all the way through, typically things like HubSpot's got really cool integrations directly with ad platforms that help you track all the way those ads and that spend all the way back down to who became a customer, when they became a customer, how long it took for them to become a customer. I'm starting to look at those things. So a lot of times we, you know, UTMs are great, but they have their limitations as well. So being able to implement UTMs, being able to in in implement those direct integrations, make sure tracking on your website is not getting broken if somebody switches between websites and different pages. Those are really like the big things that we see because that has downstream ripple effects. You start to, uh, it's hard to tell the marketing story once you have a lot of siloed systems in that place. The other big one that we see, and I mentioned it before, but it's like that marketing to sales handoff. I would say the big thing that we see in operations and which I think operations should be responsible for is that marketing sales alignment, uh, making sure the team's aligned in that way. And then if you have a sales team that they're getting leads in the correct way, lead scoring is set up the right way where their hot leads are coming across and they're actionable immediately. Even on the B2C side, just making sure that those leads have a good experience to get into the product, get products get fulfillment quickly and that things are flowing all the way down to the funnel from top of the funnel all the way down immediately and quickly. You usually see those breakdowns when they start to pass between those different phases. So going from a lead to a customer, just making sure that those systems are talking to each other. Usually that fulfillment is different than marketing automation platform, but it's just as important for that information to flow by directionally. Something you mentioned before was how with the attribution stuff specifically, you, you said there's not like a wrong or right way to do it. There's just a lot of different ways to do it. It seems like from my experience, people either have extremely hot opinions about how attribution should be done, or they have absolutely zero opinion about it whatsoever. I am curious with that though. Like there may not be a right or wrong way, but what are some of those nuances where if you're working with a company and they're asking your opinion, how would you lead them to decide, like, maybe we should do first touch versus maybe we should mm -hmm. focus more on last touch, or maybe there's some other way, like a mixed approach. Like, how do you give that advice? Yeah, for sure. And that's a great question. And it is totally hot topic, always a debate. I actually prefer the people that either have a strong opinion or have no opinion. A lot of times, some people think that attribution is a lot easier than it is. Just tell me the lead source. And it's like, that doesn't tell you the full story. So I personally like to look at multiple attribution models. I think the each channel has like its own unique characteristics to it. For example, if you're running retargeting ads, you wouldn't be looking at retargeting ads and how they're performing on a first touch model. So, you know, that's something where you'd start to maybe leverage a last touch model or a U shaped or a W shaped. So I think looking at all those channels and looking at the impact in that revenue attribution or the lead attribution across all those channels, across all those different attribution models is really where you start to get the full story. I personally have a couple that I like. I like the first touch. I like last touch. I like a U-shaped, which gives a lot of credit to first touch and last touch. And then I also like a W-shaped, which is first touch, middle touch, and then last touch as well. I'm starting to give you like that full picture of what's happening or where it's happening. For example, a lot of people include email in their, in their attribution as well. And it's like, that's either a middle touch or a last touch. And like I said, the retargeting is usually a last touch, but when you have things like paid search, you usually see that high performing on a first touch. So trying to look at all those different models and 
see which channels are performing where also helps guide your strategy a little bit as well. Like maybe you want to optimize more spend on acquisition and paid search, as opposed to acquisition and paid social, maybe paid social is a good assisting channel and you're seeing a lot of good attribution down the funnel with it. And those are good ways to start to look at holistically your strategy a little bit more. Like I said, no right way to do it, but there's probably a wrong way to do it. <laughs> if we zoom out a little bit, this one will be a little bit more existential, I guess, but I'm yeah. curious how you would sell marketing operations as a way to increase revenue, essentially. Like if you were mm -hmm. basically the salesperson for marketing ops as a concept, how would you sell it as a clear way to generate more revenue? Yeah, I, I love that question because I think operations, whether it be revenue operations, marketing operations, sales operations, I think it is a revenue driving function. And I don't think that folks internally, like if I'm working in a company in marketing ops, I don't think they do a good enough job selling that to the company that we are driving revenue. And I think that's a big push in our, in our communities to start to show the value that it's doing there. I think marketing ops, I'll start there as a strategy driving function. So I say to CMO's best friend, they can not only optimize spend, so you get in better CAC or better ROI. But you're also allocating money across channels and being able to see where, where the tracking is set up and where you can start to allocate those dollars and that budget. You can not only reduce costs, but then you can put it in high performing channels. So you can really improve lead acquisition in those things as well. I also think there's a big, especially on the sales op side, but also on the marketing op side is efficiency. So if a person or a team member on the marketing or sales side can do more with less and do more in less time. You start starting to talk about efficiency gains across the team. And that is exponential as you're starting to talk about a team, five, 10, 20, if each person is saving a couple hours per week, you're starting to be more efficient and starting to be more guided in that way as well. And then just overall, like reporting, a lot of times revenue operations in general is helps those CFOs on actual financial reporting and where customers coming in, what that looks like. And that actually will drive strategy conversations as well. I think efficiency and then also there's a cost savings component as well, but then also on the marketing and sell side, being able to drive that strategy to improve where dollars are spent, maximize ROI, I think it's pretty. So efficiency is an interesting one that you just bring up, which leads me to a tangent, but maybe you have a, an opinion yeah. on this. So there, so the AI stuff that's coming out now, yeah. there are tools for marketing ops specifically like chat spot within Hub, a HubSpot instance. Oh. Now you got tools that can like really help answer questions on the fly and take your efficiency to the next level. I'm just curious if you played around with these and what your first impression is and where you think this kind of goes. Yeah. So I think the potential of them is all really great. I played around with ChatSpot a lot. Salesforce has got Einstein GPT coming out. There's a couple, you know, obviously ChatGPT, there's some cool things that you can do with integrations there and worksheets and things like that as well. I think the potential is really cool. I don't know that anyone has been mind blowing at just this point. I think ChatSpot has got some cool features that I would hope that Salesforce would adopt as well, where you can like tell me a list of customers that have done X, Y, and Z or pull a report that does this. Um, some of those things are really cool. And I think it opens up a whole world of interactions with these marketing automation platforms. I feel like maybe dating myself a lot. I used to go back and you used to have to write code to interact. I remember having to write SQL to pull campaigns and do things like that. Then I like transitioning it into declarative programming where it's like point and click and drag and drop and all that fun stuff. Now I think you're starting to see like this chat interaction. And it's just a new way that like really programming is happening on the back end, which can actually start to interact with them. So I think it opens up for non-technical folks to start to do more yeah. technical things. And then it really comes down to what are the limitations of the tool at that point? Like, can I build a campaign? Can I tell it to build me a funnel that has a 10 step nurture program and that has lead scoring intertwined? I think that's where we're going. And I think that that's really cool. I think right now, even the basics of having a marketer be able to go into HubSpot and say, pull me a report that is showing like my customers in the last 10, 10 months that came from paid ads in this particular campaign. I think that's really powerful because then you don't need to go to a marketing ops person in order to pull that report. And as a marketing ops person, those are the tasks that bog you down a lot. So it's kind of hope, helps open up that, that bandwidth a little bit more, which I think is really cool. Yeah, for sure. A lot of interesting stuff moving there. I do want to cover GA4 because I think that's a big thing right now that more people probably need to be aware of. There's been some awareness around this, but there's some big stuff coming that's going to impact a lot of people. And so for the people listening in that are like very casually aware of it or not aware of it at all, maybe you can just talk through the specifics of the GA4 transition. Like what's new with Google Analytics now? What should we do about it? What are the things we should know around this transition? 
Yeah, it's funny because I think a lot of people thought that Google was bluffing. Like, I think that they were like, all right, I'm going to be able to use Universal. You say that it's going to be over in July, but, but it's happening. And, you know, what's really driving it, and most people don't know this, is that there's like EU privacy laws that were passed. Um, and actually Universal Google Analytics is actually illegal under those laws. And the way that tracking is set up, Google was like, we're not even going to try and fix UA. We're actually just going to roll out GA4, which is a new tracking, new there's some, I'll talk about some of the components that go into the tracking, but ultimately that's the driver that's, so this is happening, right? So a lot of people have said, July is going to come and I'm just going to continue to use UA. Well, you're behind the ball there because the data model is fundamentally different. What's tracking some of the metrics in UA, universal GA4 is fundamentally different. So if you don't have set up your universal or your GA4, the goal was to set it up a year ago. You're not going to have that historical data because the universal data can't port over to GA4. So there's some cool things that you can do with Data Studio to try and get those views, but you're really going to miss out on that tracking. You have to start from scratch with Google Analytics 4. Ultimately, Google Analytics 4 is just a different way, different tracking code. I mean, like I said, different data models. So there's different data points in there. It uses some like statistical modeling to help with some of those like PII gaps and some of those different cookies that third-party cookies going away and being able to still track information across websites. And I think the big difference there that's worth noting, which I personally love as an analytics guy, is a universal analytics is session-based and most markers. Like, if you've played around with Google Analytics in your history, it drives you crazy because it's like, I want to know what this person did and where they went. It's like, what was their session? And then they did this. And, and it's like very aggregated. It makes your head spin. But in G4, you can actually get down to the user level. So you get a lot more in-depth attribution. You can get a lot more in-depth journey matching and tracking. And then it also helps with like your other integration. So like if you're connecting to Google Analytics and Google Ads, you have like really cool integrations that you can do now that you can fire off a lot more different conversion events and different events that are a lot more specific to what the user did and what their journey was. And that actually helps optimize your ads way better. So there's those efficiency gains in terms of improving your ads and your, your strategy there. But then there's also just the general setup that you're going to have a lot more insights and reporting and get a lot more in-depth insights into what's happening on your website and what the users are doing. But like I said, a lot of people think that they're bluffing, even though every time you sign into Google Analytics up top, it has a big banner and it says, Hey, like this is happening in July. Like you better, better change over. But yeah, alarm bells have been ringing for a little while now. If you haven't done it yet, you pretty sure you do it pretty soon. Yeah. I, so the deadline's July 1st. Is that? That's correct. July 1st, 2023. Overwhelmingly, I would say from people in my circles, overwhelmingly people hate this. They hate yeah, GA4. They know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am curious why you think so many people hate it. Because you've listed yeah. off, you've actually listed off some positives, which is great. You don't hear a ton of yeah. that, but why, why are people so bearish on GA4? Yeah, I like to say that people grew up with Google Analytics, right? Like, like when I learned how to track a website and when I learned metrics, when I first learned about bounce free and I learned about all those different metrics, it was Google Analytics. It was the free tool that everyone's been using and learned how to navigate. I also think user interfaces, even on the marketing ops and sales ops type of things, I think once a user interface changes, a lot of people like freeze and they get a little worried about what weird things are. How can I find my source medium report? It doesn't jump out at me. I used to be able to navigate so easily and the UIs are very different. I think that kind of throws people off a little bit as well. Also out of the box, I probably screw up the numbers a little bit here, but out of the box in universal, there's like 80 something reports in universal, but actually in GA4, there's like 20 something. So the number of out of the box reports has gone down quite a bit, but you have more custom report capability. So I think even just that, just getting into the GA4 and being able to not see everything that you're accustomed to seeing and just seeing things look a little different, I think it gives people a lot of anxiety. I think they just start to see, I, I used to know how to use this. I've used this for my whole career. And now you're telling me that it's changing. I think it just, even there's some metrics that are changing. I think there's a, everyone was up in arms because they were taking out the a bounce rate and it was actually engagement rate. But now they brought that bounce rate back because everyone got a little mad. But like things like that, like those slight changes and nuances going from sessions to users just starts to make people a little confused. So I think that's really uh, the hesitancy for people to move over. And then also the hesitancy to fully adopt it just yet. So you sounded the warning, but I am, I just want to have you reiterate, like what happens if I don't switch over? What are the real risks here for companies that don't do this in time or they don't plan it out well, at least, and they just do like the bare minimum? Yeah. After the cutoff date, you'll see nothing tracking in your universal. So it will just stop tracking data. So the only 
insights or analytics that you'll have is historical. Let's say on July 2nd, you haven't switched over. I'll go into Google Analytics, look at everything from July 2nd forward, and I'll just see zeros. So it's a little concerning that way because you'll use all your tracking. The other thing that I like to say is a lot of people have in Google ads, you can set up conversion events that pull directly from goals in Google Analytics. So if you've set that up in Universal and you have your ads optimized off of some of these conversion events or goals in your Universal Google Analytics, um, that could break some of your ad optimizations as well because it will no longer be tracking. Some concerns on paid fun, but then also just on your general reporting and attribution, how heavily you use analytics you could be missing out on some big data there. Is there anything when I get into GA4 that I should build out differently than I did with Universal Analytics? Any best practices that I should be aware of? Yeah, I think G4 does a cool job of getting like some standard events in there. It used to be that if you wanted to set up goals, you'd have to go in and like set up this goal. I don't know if you're familiar, like you have to say like destination goal. If they land on this page, it's a conversion or whatever. What You can just go into the admin section in GA4 to see a list of all your events and you can just tick a box that tells you which is a conversion. But I would go through and make sure that some of those major events that are important for you are conversions because that influences some of the other reporting that you can do right out of the box. So some of your attribution reporting, some of your conversion and general reporting, things like that. But when you start to look at like your medium and source reports and things like that, you can start to see those conversions on the side. Like you used to be able to see in UF and Universal, but you can do that. You just got to make sure that they're ticked as conversions. The other thing I would say is there's like an analyze tab and I would play around with that. Just get familiar with digging into that. It's a little different, but I think just playing around and start to add secondary dimensions will start to give people a lot more familiarity about GA4 and maybe how it was similar to Universal, even though out of the box feels a little different. And then if you start to feel more comfortable, then there's some really cool like custom reports in the insights tabs there. And it just, uh, you can sky's the limit with that. If you're familiar with Data Studio, there's a lot that you can do. Um, it's very similar in that way, but there's also some cool out of the box reports that they recommend for you based on your data. So there's some cool insights and things that just, they're using AI to put right into your face, which is really helpful. All right. This has been super helpful. At the end of this, we have talked about marketing operations, rev ops. We talked GA4 and universal analytics at the very end of this all, any parting thoughts of whether it's things we didn't cover that you would like to put out there or just a recap of maybe the most poignant things that you think have come up? Yeah, I think the important thing that I would like people to take from this is that operations isn't necessarily just order taking and execution. It could really be a strategic partner. And I think for demand gen folks or for marketing leaders or even folks trying to excel in the operations folks, the more strategic you can be and the more you can try and solve business problems with technology and data, that's really where operations starts to take hold. It's not just so much pulling reports and taking orders. It's really being proactive identifying areas in the business where you can start to make that impact and identifying overall business strategies and how it can be solved with different technology and data. I think that's really where it comes down to um, those best marketing ops folks that do that. They're a CMO's best friend. They're a CRO's best friend, head of sales, because they can really be that proactive force that helps drive strategy. 